Hello Squid Schoolers and welcome back to Map Mode of the Day. Today, our Patreon supporters have chosen that we're going to be talking about Splat Zone's Wahoo World. If you would like to have input on which map mode I choose for the next map mode of the day, I offer that to my Patreon supporters. I really appreciate the support, it's going to be instrumental in allowing me to keep the channel going and making more content available to you guys. So if that's something you're interested in, there's a link in the description. But even if not, a like and a subscription goes a long way towards helping this channel grow, so I would really appreciate that as well. Thank you so much, guys. Like we talked about in the Snapper Canal Splat Zones video, which was the first Splat Zones video we did, so we talked a little bit more about the mode, the concept of an objective line isn't great for Splat Zones because the objective doesn't really move. It's always in the same spot all the time. So really, rather than trying to push forward to gain better control of the objective to get to the point where you're at the enemy clam goal, to get the point where you're getting the Rainmaker into the enemy pedestal, to get to the point where the tower is near the end of the game, it's just one static thing that you have to protect for the entire match. On this map mode, it's pretty linear. There is actually kind of an argument for visualizing it with a line, just because of how few ways there are to get to that objective. Snapper Canal is kind of the direct opposite of this map in that respect. On Snapper, you have so many different ways to get into mid, and it's extremely, extremely wide in mid. But let me draw you something really quick. This is a rough outline of what the playable area looks like on the map. This map is relatively wide at its widest point, you know, from here to here, but it scrunches right here in the middle, right here at the single most important part of the entire map, you have fewer options for moving around than you have any place else. So let's draw the hot zone here to show how limited this map is and how you really can just kind of push the enemy back in a single file line in a couple places and kind of think about having an objective line because of how few flank routes there are. Areas where you can control the zone from. It's got this kind of four leaf clover shape. If you're anywhere off this hot zone, it is going to take you at least a good five seconds to be able to reach the zone. It seems, you know, from the overhead, like, oh, it, this area is pretty close, right? Wrong. It's gonna take you about six seconds to get to here from this position, maybe even more than that and it's about the same amount of time to get underneath and get up the top here. Unless you are in the zone that I have sketched out here, it's going to take you so long to get to the zone that it's almost prohibitive. You just kind of don't want to be there unless you're going to get a lot of benefit out of something like a flank. The battle line, if you want to think about it that way, the line at which you're going to meet your opponents if you get to mid at equal speed is right about here. So you're expected to probably control this area if they're controlling this area. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have at least some pressure coming from each of these sides. You always want to be pinching your opponents. You always want a pincer movement. So if somebody is on the zone here, you want them being contested both from this side and from this side. If you don't have that, the entire enemy team can just look this way. Or the entire enemy team can just look this way and look at how narrow of a zone they have to control. That is pitiful compared to Snapper Canal, where we had those huge wide arcs that you need to be able to control. You know, if they just have to worry about an area this wide on unpaintable turf, and you're trying to funnel your entire team on the right side, that is gonna get shut down by like one player. So you really need that pressure from multiple sides and realistically, you also just really need specials. Breaching a choke point that's this small, breaching a choke point that's this small, is just kind of unrealistic to expect unless you are using brute force. This is one of the premier tent umbrella maps. Being able to put the tent shield across this entire choke point and extend this forward and paint the entire zone and let your entire team get in from that that utility is insane. You see a lot of bubble tent on this map because 
the shield plus the bubbles crowds all of the space that your opponents can possibly hope to control in the hot zone here. That kind of approach works really well. Specials too, it's so, so important to pop a special if you're gonna try and regain control of some part of the hot zone. Because otherwise, you know, think about this position right here. This is really, really exposed. You've got threats that can come from here. You've got someone who can be standing on this wall shooting at you. If you've got like an Explo or something or a bucket, they can be standing behind this wall and hitting you. And you can also get attacked from this direction. And if they're coming from this direction, if they're on the unpaintable turf, that probably means they've got some range to work with. And so you're probably not going to win that fight if you're something like a short range shooter. If you're going to get to this position and try and control anything like it, and you're going to have to do that if you want to get to here or to here most of the time, then you need something that is taking this player out of position while you push at them. You need something to get you across there, and it's not going to be, you know, your, your firepower alone that's going to do that. One little option that you have to create a little bit more of a distraction uh, without resorting to specials is there is a situational flank that you can do by dropping down in this direction, swimming underneath the enemy platform here, coming out the other side and coming around this corner and coming up behind them. This flank is very good in that it is a 180 degree flank. You will come up behind charger players who are looking in the complete opposite direction of you. But it is a weak flank in that it takes so long to execute. Um, you have to go all the way out and then double back. You're off the hot zone for a good, at least I would say five or six seconds. Um, and even then you're only popping up over here. You're not likely to be able to paint the zone right away. So that's most of a respawn timer that you are spending off the hot zone. If you're gonna go for that, you need to make sure that the rest of the team can hang in there while you're away. You also need to make sure that um, your time wouldn't be better spent someplace else if you're going for that. Also, a really good player is going to be checking this because they know that this is one of the only sneaky flanks that you can actually pull off on this map. Mid is just such a bottleneck that, okay, yeah, this is dangerous, but if it's the only dangerous thing, it's a lot less dangerous. Um, and so a good charger player, you know, a good support somebody who's going to be posted on the back line here a lot, they're probably checking their map every now and again to make sure that this area right here doesn't get painted by the enemy team. And as soon as they spot that, they're going to be snapping around and trying to deal with it. Now, their ability to deal with it depends on their ability to fight at this range, because usually you're underneath this wall by then, and this wall is actually really fantastic cover against someone who's above you like that. Um, they really have to kind of like right peek over the side or something. And a lot of the time you can actually use that cover to get in range in time. So it's still definitely worth going for when they allow it to happen. But the amount of time that it puts you out of play is really rough. One way that you can flank the other side, and this is a little bit quicker because it starts from your strong side here. This is the area that you can paint the most and therefore it's the area where you have the most advantage to push out from. You can drop down from here, as long as there's nobody shooting at you from this direction, and you definitely want to check for that before you go for this. And as long as you can either get down from there, or if you really need to, you can swing down from this direction. So maybe this is one way that you get out of this position if there's someone above you. You can sneak around here, paint this wall, and come up over the top. And the big advantage of doing that is that if nobody spots you on the ground here, before you get to that wall, they're not going to spot you on the wall. They just don't have the sight lines. Somebody who's right here cannot see over the top of this wall. While you're on this wall, while you're popping up over here even, they don't know that you're here yet. Now, a player who's here and who has played this map a lot will know to be checking this, um, but it is an important thing to threaten every now and then, just so that this player doesn't get to get off scot-free that they don't get to just focus on the zone, that they always have to at least be worried that there's someone who might come up over here. This is a great flank for weapons that hit up over ledges. Things like tri sloshers and brushes love this because they don't need to get off this annoying unpaintable turf right here to be able to start doing damage to you. They can just hit up over the top 
while you're trying to focus on something else. Dualies also kind of like this because they can get out in this direction really quickly and uh, throw you off from the angle you expect to have to shoot people from. So that's something that you can go for. And the only other really kind of sneaky way that you can get into mid, it's a little bit niche because you're kind of coming from the same direction as from here. But let's say that you are here and you want to get to the zone. You could go over this way, but this is unpaintable turf the whole way, and that might not be advantageous for you and your weapon. What you could also do is come this way, where you're behind cover, behind this wall, and you can actually paint the side of this wall right here. And you can hop into this wall and then pop up over the top of the ledge from there. Now, that doesn't give you a great escape route. If you get up on top of this wall and decide you want to bail, your option is drop all the way down onto this area. Or if you're lucky, you can drop onto here. But if you do that, they're likely to be able to bomb you out or something. So it's a bigger commitment, but it's also a way to get into mid that's a little bit less visible until you drop into mid. And then once you drop into mid, <laughs> they can just all see you and it's really dangerous. So that's why I say it's niche. It's a sneaky way to get there. And so if somebody like wanders into your line of sight and you can just jump them with a tri slosher from here, that's really nice. And that's something you got to watch out for if there's an enemy player unaccounted for. But I wouldn't say, you know, strategically, if you're trying to go for a big special push and just force them out, there's only so much you're going to get away from that. Um, you might as well just kind of move in from an angle that you can back up from. So your objective on offense is cut off this choke point, cut off this choke point. Once you've got that under control, now you are trying to set up a lockout. And lockouts on this map do happen a lot. They are pretty common. You see a lot of KOs here, a lot of really quick matches. Because you've just got to force your way in from one of these angles the vast majority of the time. Doing that takes a lot of force. And once the enemy team has splatted you, they have more special charge than you do. What they're going to do on, on offense, they're going to paint up this ledge so it cuts off your ability to rotate from one side to the other through the hot zone. Why can't they just go from here? Because dropping down out of the hot zone here is going to cost you a good five or six seconds. Dropping down to this area right here, it's like, oh, it's so close to the zone. No, this is an overhead view. You need to spend a good five or six seconds running all the way back up there. And there's really no fast way to do it. If you are on this ledge and you drop down, you are sacrificing a very large amount of time uh, to be able to get back. So you should only really want to do that in the event that you're going to get splatted in every other circumstance. Because it's almost a respawn timer, you know? About 10 seconds or so is what a respawn timer is. Six seconds, that's something like a super jumping out. You know, that's taking you out of play for a really long time, especially if you're dropping back on the defensive side here and there's still a fight going on in mid. This area, yes, you can rotate back and forth, but it's a very slow rotation. It's also a very exposed rotation. As soon as you've got this area painted here, you could put whatever kind of range you want right here, and they're gonna be able to see everything in that area. Uh, it's really risky a lot of the time to try and make yourself too visible down here because you just don't have any advantages in fighting anybody. You don't have any cover at all. You're at the lowest ground in the entire stage. There's just not a lot that you're going to be able to do from there that you couldn't do from someplace else. So usually as the attacking team trying to get back into mid, you don't want to end up having to like option select back and forth to be like, oh, which way am I going? Uh, I'm going this way now. You want to commit to one side or the other. If you see that somebody is already going here, maybe you come out this way. If you see that everybody is on this side, and everybody's coming in from the bottom, and nobody is coming in from the top, you need to rotate over to the top so that you can apply some pressure there and give this push any chance of success. On lockout, one thing that you do have to respect is this area right here. This is uncontestable high ground, so always going to be in the defending team's favor. And this is probably one of the only saving graces of this map competitively, because you've got uncontestable high ground that is really pretty close to the zone. And it's also all paintable. It's got this nice curvature that makes it so that it's really difficult for a Hydra to just like immediately know where you are and shoot fall off shots over the top and hit you from there. They kind of have to guess a little bit sometimes. And so that can, you know, help you stay alive long enough to get special. 
it is imperative that the defending team use this area to farm specials, get some paint down here so they don't get sharked, get all of this covered so they can come in from any angle, and most importantly, get their specials. Because if you're going to have to cram it up mid just like that, then you're going to need all of the force that you can muster to do that. That doesn't mean that you use all of your specials at exactly the same time. You probably want to get the push started with a couple specials, maybe one to displace them and then an armor, something like that, and then stagger the specials in. So maybe the first special push gets your players up this far, and then the second wave of specials comes in and is able to force you further forward on the zone. And that's what can really help you coordinate with your teammates to push the opponents back. But that requires you having almost all of your specials on the team, which means that before any of that happens, all y'all are playing incredibly safe, not getting picked, not dropping down and feeding to their rollers or tri sloshers down here, not getting shot out by a sniper or a splatling that's right here, not just trying to make a random flank over here and getting picked by a midliner who's standing here or a frontliner who's standing here, you need to be really, really disciplined with your pushes back in, or this game is going to end extremely quickly. Let's talk about which roles are going to do what. Your frontliners are going to be really important on this map, because again, pushing in is just so dang difficult. A skirmisher is a really, really useful weapon to have here because there's so few angles where you are able to direct their attention in two different places. So something like a tent that is actually going to draw aggro and allow someone to come in from a different angle. A tent being right here gives this player way more options because everybody's going to be looking at the tent instead of them. Brushes are really popular here because of this flank being so devastating and because of their ability to take those different angles on the map when you need them in those positions. As you push in, like we mentioned, you need at least two different angles that you're pushing from. Generally, I like to designate this as like the midline or support or skirmishers position. This is some place where you don't have the advantage. This is the weak side because you have to push over unpaintable turf to get to zone from here. Whereas here you have all this cover and you have stuff that you can paint. You're going to be able to get more out of putting a lot of players on this side, which means you're going to be leaving the player on this side more alone and therefore they need to be more self-sufficient. Something like a, a splatter shot here, it, it's not its best place to be because it doesn't have the range to deal with a long stretch of unpaintable turf right there in front of it. As soon as anybody with more range steps into a position with this line of sight right here, they are going to be able to beat this player in a fight and no amount of a short range shooter's maneuverability helps when they're on unpaintable turf. They're kind of just a sitting duck from there. Now, if you're walking over here and you're a CDS or you're a tent umbrella, you have a way of dealing with someone if they try to fight you head on at this point. And so that's what I usually prefer to see. I usually prefer to see some kind of skirmish weapon up here. Tentabrella is of course very effective here and you can kind of lead the troops in from there, but Generally, the, the way that top players are going to run a tent umbrella is they're going to use the tent to try and draw your aggro away from what the rest of their team is doing. They're not going to try and become a tank like a, like a Reinhardt player in Overwatch where they walk in and the whole team is in there behind them. Although they can do that for certain set plays, more often what you get out of a tent is two people are trying to take out the tent and then you come in from a different angle and mop up everybody else. And this is the route for the tent to take to make that happen. On defense, if you are coming in and trying to push back out to the zone from the right hand side, one option that you have available to you, rather than taking the low ground approach that is going to make you vulnerable to someone standing up here or someone standing up here, you do have the option to use this rail. This rail gives you a couple of options. One of those options is to stand here and right side peek around this wall, which can be good. Another option, if you want to be a little bit more exposed but have a little bit more height advantage, is you can actually take the rail and jump onto this wall. And you do see a lot of, say, rapid players who like to stand on this wall and shoot down because it gives them just a little bit better uh, line of sight than they would have someplace else. 
This area right here is a little bit more narrow, a little bit easier to shut down. Whereas if you're up here, you can always drop back and be safe. And you're just a little bit further away from them, it's a little bit harder for them to pre-fire or throw bombs at it. So that's an option that you have in getting someone clear of this area before you, you know, are gonna pop specials as a team and then drop down at the same time that they're pushing in from this direction to start applying pressure. Once you have control, the frontliners have a few more options because remember mid is the most scrunched part of the map and once you start pushing forward in this direction, you st it starts to widen out a lot. You gain a lot more width of the map and that means that there are a lot more places that you can go. Now, most of these places are terrible for you to be in, frankly. You do not want to be here. This is way too visible. There's too much uncontestable high ground around you. You do not really want to spend a lot of time in this location because you're in the lowest ground on the map. You're far away from the zone. It's very easy for someone to just slip past you and for you to not be able to do as much about it. If you're going to be down here, this is the kind of position you want to be taking because you're able to cover someone who goes out this way or someone who drops down here. And those are both very common ways for players to get back into the zone. If you are a ambush weapon, you might want to be sitting like along this wall here. If they're not checking for it, you know, little patch of ink down there uh, can make a big difference for you if somebody decides to drop down over the top and you have their back now. Um, so that's an option for you to go for. As soon as you get past about this line though, you are probably putting yourself out of play. Let's say you do actually catch one player rotating out over here and you get a pick on them. That's nice and all, but you yourself are also so far out of play that the fight that's going on for mid is still a 3v3. You are not able to use the numbers advantage that you win if you push this far forward. And so you're basically just relying on the rest of your team at that point to hold the zone rather than doing anything about it yourself. And same deal going in like right here. If somebody rolls out in this direction, there's no way you catch them from all the way over here. And so you're basically putting all of your chips on somebody coming this way. And again, if it's only one player who comes there and you have an advantageous fight because you have their backs, you've only removed one player from play and you're removing yourself from play. If two players were to come this direction, now you're at a disadvantage in that fight. And so what benefit can you really hope to get out of it? You either end up in a bad fight, or you end up in a fight that you win, but that doesn't get you anything. So it's better to really just hold this line right here. Ideally, you know, you have some control over here. Maybe there's a backline weapon up on the, the snipe here that's actually putting down some threat on that. Realistically, though, this is pretty uncontestable right here. And so this is one of the key places that you're going to want to watch for people dropping from. As soon as people drop from here, it's go time. If they overcommit without using specials or without having numbers, that is when you rush in here and mop them up. If they drop down here and they're popping like armor and missiles at the same time right now, now is the time to double back to the zone and make sure that all of your routes into the hot zone are completely shut off and that you've got the maximum power behind that defense at that moment in time because that's when your opponent is really starting to push in and they don't have to push in too far like i said one of the saving graces of this map is this area right here you have very early access to the zone there's not a lot of ground that you can give up before you're just giving up the zone for free you can't just like back up this far and completely stuff an armor push um, they're still going to have armor by the time they get to this line, and you need to start defending before this line gets to about here. Usually the way to play against that, the way to defend against the opposing team pushing in with a lot of force from here, is to use your own specials to counteract their specials. So as they're dropping with their missiles, if they themselves are missiled, it will stall for a little bit of time before they're able to start putting this zone up again. And during that time, you can outlast the missiles they launched, and then you actually have a, a shot of holding them here. But realistically speaking, uh, if they do get a really good coordinated special push off, you might get forced back. You might lose the zone. 
Um, and remember that even as a slayer and skirmisher, even as someone whose job it is to take the opposing team out of play to push them back, you gotta pick your battles. You gotta go in only when you have a feeling that you have a good chance of winning that. And so if you need to give up the zone, but preserve your life, do it, you know? As long as you're able to stay into this kind of position and not let them start walling you out and locking you out, um, as long as you don't go down, your team can keep contesting the zone and eventually you can win a way in for your support and keep the push going in your favor. That brings us to the support. You're gonna be painting a lot on this map mode. Since it's such a stalemate in mid a lot of the time, a lot of your time is going to be spent finding what is the safe position that I can paint the zone from. A lot of the time the answer is going to be something like this. Um, you've got to watch out for something like a longer ranged weapon cross firing from over here. Um, if you give a charger this kind of angle on you that's a really quick way to lose the zone because they take your painting power out and now you've got nothing to, to work with. If you're here, the biggest thing you need to be worried about is someone pushing in from this direction. Pushing across the zone and approaching you from over here. That's probably pretty predictable if you are watching the right angles here. Because you can just, you know, look over here and clearly see them around if you're right peeking around that corner. But make sure that you're not like right behind the wall and just painting up over the top right here and not paying any attention to a push coming through from that direction because that can catch you out. You also always have to be worried about this flank and you are a prime target for a flanker because if they remove you from play, they not only remove a lot of special output, they remove your ability to control the zone uh, from your team. So keep yourself alive, especially if you have a special ready to go. If your team starts going down, just preserve that special. You can jump back to spawn, and it's okay to give up that much ground because you just get back in from over here, and your team is still going to take longer to get to this point and get out to the same position as you. So you're not even sacrificing that much in terms of time or map control by just getting yourself out of there. But uh, make sure to keep yourself alive as the support because you are going to be really important for having that brute force to push in one of these choke points. Backlines. So we'll start off by taking a look at Debbie's backline positioning map. There aren't that many positions on this map because there just isn't that big of a hot zone. In neutral or on defense, you know, when you don't have control of the zone right now, Obviously, this position is going to be really strong, uncontestable high ground. Using this pillow here can be nice because you can right side peek around it, so that's a pretty good option. You can stand on top of this, and this is better for a long ranged weapon because obviously you're very exposed, but the advantage of having the range is that you're able to use that range to stop people before they get in range to punish you for being exposed. You can just kind of back up a little bit on the ledge and give your opponent a much smaller target to be able to hit. So that can be a nice position to take. Of course, having range here can be nice, although you do have to worry about this flank if you're going to be over here, so that's something to be watching for sure. It might be a good idea to, for instance, stand on this position right here. That way you can see down over the top. You can also get good angles on people over here. This is really useful crossfire with a weapon that's long range enough to threaten someone over there. You also can right peek this corner, and this position right here is just generally very strong for a lot of weapons because of that right side peak advantage and because of their ability to see anybody who could be coming at them from any direction with a pretty untouched line of sight. On offense, you're, you're gonna be probably in one of two places most of the time. One of those places is gonna be here, one of those places is gonna be here. Like I said, this ledge right here gives you so much vision over the enemy court, you can see where the enemy team is rotating to. And the beauty of being in the middle is that you can go to wherever the action is from here. You can rotate this direction if you need to, and you can rotate this direction if you need to. That's a really powerful position, and that's some place that's really, really common to see backline weapons. Being here gives you the strongest point where you could potentially contend against someone over here. So if, for example, somebody's getting a little bit too uh, greedy for paint to get a special, and they, they're they trying to paint down here, you might actually have shots on them because you're in this position and you have the range to hit up over this ledge. And if you get that sort of pick on someone, that can delay the enemy push by quite a bit. The non-traditional position that Devi likes on this map is actually here. 
People are going to expect you to be in one of these two positions because they're absolutely busted positions. And so if, say, a flanker is coming in from this direction, they might not expect a Hydra to all of a sudden walk out with full charge and delete them before they get that far. And at that point in time, you've won yourself a numbers advantage. You can rotate back to this very powerful position and still be in control for the fight to come. That's about all there was in terms of positioning there, because again, this hot zone is so small on this map. There are only so many things that you need to do to lock it out. Key positions. Like we said, it's not gonna take an awful lot to lock out on this map, and so there are only so many positions we need to cover. We've already mentioned this area quite a bit. This is the strongest defensive staging point. This piece of cover right here is one of the few places where someone can hide as they approach the zone from the front door. If you're able to put bombs back there, if you're able to target that with specials, um, if you're able to maybe hit up over the top of that cover, that will often flush players out into line of sight of your players who are looking in these directions. So that's a really useful position to have control of. This ledge right here, you have easy access to mid, but a lot of cover. And again, from this position right here, you have line of sight on anything that can possibly threaten you. Um, it's pretty difficult to push that location safely. The only time that I usually go for it is if I think they're not ready. And if I'm going to push it, the way that I'm going to do that is by swinging wide around this corner because they're going to expect you to come straight on, but this gives them massive right side peak advantage and it also gives you information much less quickly and their aim is more likely to be trained on that spot. If you swing around this way, they might initially start shooting in this direction and be missing you and then you can catch them out that way. This also makes it so that uh, if somebody's a little bit further back, you're going to spot them before they threaten you, and you're gonna be able to do something about that. Whereas if you were already over here, you're already so close to this player that you're committed. Definitely recommend taking this kind of an angle as long as you know that there's nobody over here. And if there is somebody over to here, then you probably shouldn't be making this play in the first place. Mid is kind of a no man's land most of the time. If you're pushing into mid, you wanna be in one of these locations probably. Um, that gives your opponents the least sight lines on you because from this angle and from this angle it's kind of awkward to try and hit you and those are where your opponents are likely to be but it's really unsafe to be there a lot of the time if you're here and you feel like you're locked down you've probably overcommitted to something you probably shouldn't have been there in the first place you want to only go here by way of getting out in this direction or getting out in this direction this right here plat is extremely important to hold because this is the best place for the enemy team to push in from. So if you're on offense and you're able to keep this painted, keep this area below painted, if you're able to prevent people from coming in from this direction, um, if you're able to put bombs underneath these players as they drop down, that's the pressure that's really going to stop the main body of the enemy push. And you're really trying to fish for those kinds of picks before the push goes out because otherwise it's just a matter of who uses their specials better who pushes in with more force finally like we've mentioned always keep this here painted this is a really important flank route you need to know as soon as the enemy team is pushing through there you want to be able to flick open your map and see their paint right here so that you have time to react to that flank if you don't catch it here you simply do not have time before a brush is already behind you you need to see this is happening and then immediately look down and then you might have a chance of being able to spot it out. That's one of the reasons why uh, it's really useful to, on lockout, put someone right here. Not just so that the enemy team doesn't have this angle, but also so that they don't have access to this flank. If you're able to cut that off, then your backliners are going to be sitting pretty over here, not having to worry at all about their backs and only having to worry about what's in front of them on the zone. Main goals. Obviously your whole goal is to control this entire hot zone. And until you can do that, you have to consider yourself to be in neutral or on defense. It's a relatively small area to control, but like we said, it takes overwhelming force to get in there. So make sure that you're pushing with the rest of your team. 
There's no excuse not to push with the rest of your team on this map. There's just so little map that they're going to be moving in from. So just look with your eyes at where your teammates are. Push at the same time they do. Dropping down here early, especially dropping down here early, going up here without support. These are all very easy ways to give the other team easy picks and give them an easy lockout situation on you. So avoid doing that on defense. Make sure that you're being disciplined, make sure that you're painting, and make sure that you're pushing in with the amount of force that will actually displace people out of here. When you get put on offense, when you have access to about this zone right here, if you win the next fight, you probably win the game, realistically speaking, regardless of where you are in the game. It only really takes about two fights that you win to be able to KO on this map. Be really, really careful and really, really safe. Give yourself the best chance possible of getting picks before they start dropping down in full force. Don't be, you know, fiddling around up here or up here trying to cheese one more pick out of it. Throw the bombs here. Maybe, you know, at most shark here and catch people as they try to rotate in. But even then, that's a little risky. Just kind of throw some bombs, get special, be ready to meet them head on when they start fighting you. Um, and that's going to give you your best shot of winning the game as quickly as you can. That'll just about do it for Wahoo World Zones. It's a relatively simple map because it's so constricting. There are so few places you can go in from, and so you're just going to need to bully your opponents out of there. If you enjoyed the content and want to see more of it, I would really appreciate a like and a subscription if you want to go one step further and be able to suggest which map mode we do next. I have a Patreon link in the description. That support from Patreon is going to be really instrumental in me being able to keep this channel going at the same rate that it is moving forward. And I would really appreciate that support so I can keep doing this full time even into Splatoon 3 and have a wealth of resources available for the new players approaching the game at that time. Thank you everybody for watching. Hope you have a good one.